so um, we are starting the new year with a new series. So a while ago, um, actually, if you chat to Malcolm or Sarah, I've been talking about teaching on John for a little while now, um, probably two or three years I've been going, I think we need to talk on John, I think we need to go through the book of John. If I go back to the, my previous sabbatical, we came back from that with this idea that if Jesus is a revelation of what God looks like, then um, we need to spend some time looking at Jesus. And we, we spent a couple of years looking at the Gospel of Mark, um, which was quite a journey for us. And um, so we're going to start a new series looking at the Gospel of John. You might go, well, why John? And there's a few reasons for that. And I just want to try and give you an introduction today as to some of my thinking around why. Um, but I'll start by telling you a story. So before, before the pandemic, um, every year... Um, Pete Gregg and um, Ken Costa and they and um, host this thing, host this event. It's about a three-day event. It's at Windsor Castle, the royal residence in this beautiful centre there. And they invite particular church leaders from around the country to come, to gather together, to pray together for the nation. And they all bring a speaker or two in. And and we, it's just a great time together. It's a beautiful place. And um, I was invited to that. I'm going... Rachel and I are going again um, beginning of next month um, when Tom Wright's going to be um, speaking. So we're quite excited about that. But on this one, um, David Ford was a speaker. And David Ford is the um, he's regent emeritus at Cambridge University for Theology. He's the, probably the world authority on the book of John. Um, and he was coming to talk to us about the book of John. I was really excited because I love the book of John. I was listening to him talk about all the themes of love and all this sort of stuff. And it was, it was brilliant. And then I had this moment, I went, oh, I need to talk to this guy. Because when I was a youth leader, so we're going back like 18 years or something now, I, I was reading a Bible one day and I was reading through John and there's this story late on in John and the, fish, the disciples are out and it's after Jesus' resurrection. The disciples have kind of gone back fishing. They've given up on stuff and, and then Jesus is on the shore and they've not caught anything and Jesus says, throw the net on the other side and they catch. And he says, and they caught 153 big fish. I'm like, what? Why do I need to know? Why do I need to know how many fish and who counted? And what, like, what's the deal? Like, why, why are you telling me this? And I was like... You know, you know, I don't know if you know, but I don't, I don't know, it's, I'm, this might just be me, but sometimes when you read the scripture and you read something, you just go, oh, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm, I'm diving in, and I'm going to come back when I've figured this out. And I, I dived in. I mean, I went, I went studying and reading. I was asking everyone. I'm such a pain. I was asking everyone, why 153? And they're going, well, it's just because that's how many fish. I'm going, no, no, not having that. I don't think they're just telling us because that's how many fish. Going, I want to know why. I went reading everything. I went, oh, there's a lot of nonsense on the internet. And um, there's all sorts of numerology stuff. And I was going, oh, my word, like, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. And I was studying. I was studying. And then I came up with a theory. And I put some things together and went, do you know what? I'm not going to go into the whole theory. And I was like, I think this is to do with Jesus. And I think this is to do with Pythagoras. And I think this is to do with Pythagoras being a god. And then I found this parable or this myth or this legend or this story about Pythagoras that actually was very similar to that story. I was going, huh, I think I know what John's up to. I think John's telling this story and he's drawing parallels with Pythagoras to kind of go, oh, your gods, because Pythagoras was regarded as a god, um, your gods are all encapsulated and surpassed by Jesus, this God. But I couldn't find this validated anywhere. And it's kind of just driven, it's just like been this little worm in my head going, is that a thing, is that a thing, I think that's a thing. And suddenly it dawned on me, what must have been 14 years later, I'm sat in front of the world authority on the book of John. I'm going, well, if anyone's going to know, this is the guy. So I went up and I... And uh, I said, look, I need to talk to you. This is going to sound crazy, but I've got this theory, and I've had this theory for about 14 years now on the 153 fish. This is what I think. Like, please put me out of my misery and tell me it's nonsense. And, like, put me straight on this. So I told him my theory. And he went, yeah, I mean, it's not a very well-known theory, but that's what I think too. And I was like, what? Sorry? He said, yeah, that's what I think too. I was going, okay. I was feeling a little boldened by this. I went, well, I've got another theory. What if this happens across all the miracles and signs in John? What if each one of them parallels with a different Greek or Roman God? 
And he went, hmm, I've not heard that before. And then he's quiet for a minute. And he went, I think you might be on something. You should study that. And I was like, what? So anyway, I came away. I've still not figured out all seven of them. Um, but I'm, I've been working on that for a little while. And, and that was another, like I guess two years ago, another little, I'd already kind of started talking about, I think we should teach John. But then the, here was this other thing. I'm going, yeah, there's something in here. Like this, this gospel is amazing. And, and the gospel of John is amazing. And if we want to understand that Jesus is yeah, Jesus is what God looks like. If we want to understand that Jesus is what God looks like, if we want to delve into that and go, God looks like Jesus, therefore, when we read about God in Scripture, how we read Scripture, how we understand the Bible, how we live life, how we understand ourselves, how we understand who God is, how we interact with God, all through the lens of Jesus, that's quite a big thing. And on one level, it might not sound like a big thing, but actually, I think as we get into it, it's a really big thing and if we want to do that then actually let's look at the gospel of john because on one level it's the entry level gospel like if you come to faith you are probably given the gospel of john or told to read the book of john or something because it's kind of like an entry level gospel on one level because it's simple it's accessible it's straightforward and it's straight lines and at the same time it is beautifully complex and profound there are so many layers to it so many so much depth to it that I was like I think this is what we need to go and look at um, I just want to deviate slightly here and go this is why um, I think us understanding Jesus as a lens through which Jesus is a revelation of what God looks like Jesus as a lens through which we look at all things is so Significant, And this is a little bit about what Jesus Collective is about as well. This is something that we've been talking about here for the last seven or eight years. Um, and there's this idea about how we gather as church. And it might be that for some of us who grew up in church, perhaps, um, this might look familiar. All those little dots of people. And there are... There are lines. It's a bounded set church. There are lines. If you believe the right things, if you do the right things, you're in. If you don't believe the right things, you're the other side of the line, you're out. If you don't do the right things, you're out. There are clear lines, what we believe, what we do, how we live, bounded set. Very much the church I grew up in, very much church probably, if you grew up in church, probably the church many of us, grew up in that's kind of how church is and then you see what happens and you'll might hear lots of people talk about deconstruction or oh I don't like that anymore I've rejected that I don't like the legalism or I don't whatever and they go I don't like the lines I don't think that's what Jesus is like and we remove the lines which feels great but then what does that mean they how do we live? What does it mean about how we live? What does it mean about who we are? What does it mean about how we gather? What are we gathering? We're not gathering around anything. We're just kind of, well, it's all nice to be here. We like each other or we're similar in some ways or whatever. And it kind of gets very fuzzy and very nondescript and very weak, very watered down. And what we would talk about here is actually being centered, set, Jesus centered, Jesus focused. And that Jesus is the lens that we look through. Jesus is who we look to, that we gather around Jesus and that we gravitate towards Jesus. And we might be coming from different aspects. We might be coming from different perspectives, from different theological understandings, from different interpretations of scripture, from different ideas about what's okay and what's not okay. We might be coming from different stories and different cultures and different contexts. But we're all gravitating towards Jesus at the center. And we learn to encounter each other and love each other through that lens. To see each other through Jesus and to see Jesus in each other. And actually the people who are least like us or who hold different opinions to us or are different cultures to us, there is an invitation for us to see Jesus in a different light through someone who has a different story. 
And so we understand how God is bigger than just us and just our story. We see Jesus in different cult cultures and contexts and stories and ideas and ways of reading scripture and whatever it might be. And so we, but we gravitate and we love each other and we make space for each other and we are disrupted by each other and we encounter God through each other. But there's also an invitation because if you're in a bounded set, well, if you're in, you're in, right? Job's done. We're all heaven bound. That's all good. I don't have to grow anymore. I'm in. I'm saved. But actually, if we're in a Jesus-centered church, if we're in a Jesus-centered community, there is always the invitation to be closer to Jesus. There is always the invitation for transformation, for repentance, for reconciliation, for freedom, for healing, for restoration, for renewal. There is always the invitation. And each of us can ask ourselves, whether we've been a Christian for five minutes or for 50 years, whether we've, we're not a Christian, but we're just on a journey, wherever we are on this journey, am I closer to Jesus today than I was a year ago? Am I closer to Jesus today than I was a month ago or a week ago? Am I moving towards or is the hardness or the rebellion in me moving me away? And we can ask each other those questions. And we, in our small groups, and our discipleship groups, and in our mentoring relationships. And so there's this invitation to move towards, always move towards Jesus. And one of the reasons why I want us to look at John, because I want us to look at Jesus. And I want us to be captivated by Jesus. And I want us to go through this series and each of us move towards Jesus. Each of us be able to say, I am more in love with Jesus. I am closer to Jesus. I am more transformed by Jesus than I was a month ago, a year ago, however long ago. Each of us moving towards Jesus because Jesus is the lens through which we see each other because Jesus is what God looks like. Okay, in Acts... We see Pentecost happen, Acts 2. The Spirit of the Lord comes down. And all these people, the disciples are filled with the Spirit, all these different people are filled with the Spirit. Pentecost happens, the Spirit of the Lord comes down, and people are speaking in different languages, and people are encountering God, and there's tongues of fire, and all these people, and it's the birth of the church. And Peter gets up to try and explain what's going on. Peter, who had just days before chickened out of standing up for Jesus, who had denied him three times, who had run away. Peter, who throughout the stories, throughout the Gospels, we see, Jesus, we see Peter totally missing the point of what Jesus was trying to do, getting the wrong end of the stick, misunderstanding that Peter, blundering, hot-headed, missing the point Peter, stands up, having just been filled with the Spirit, and tries to explain what's going on. And in Acts 2, 38, he says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Peter, filled with the Spirit, his first attempt at communicating what God is up to, what the church is about, finds himself saying, this is for everyone. Peter, the hot-headed, passionate guy who was frustrated with people, who didn't want people who weren't like him, who really didn't like Matthew very much, who, like, Peter is the guy going, I'm finding myself saying, filled by the Spirit, this is for everyone. This expansive gospel. And then we see this being worked out. You see, when we read scripture today, we kind of, clump it all together we go oh it's the new testament so these are the gospels and they're all 
for people who are kind of around or heard the stories of people around are telling the stories and then these are the letters and then these are the but it's all it's all just kind of we see it maybe two dimensionally but actually it's really helpful to understand the timeline of what's going on so we see there the first 30 something years we see Jesus life and ministry and then Jesus dies resurrects goes back to heaven Pentecost happens at that point at the end of that blue block then Paul's ministry kicks in and we see Paul's ministry happening um, really from about 35 through to about 60 AD during which and certainly the latter part of which are where his letters are coming from and he's writing his letters and if you read Paul's letters in the kind of the order that we think they were written you can see his theology evolving you can see his understanding of how big Jesus is and quite the vastness of what Jesus has done the vastness of what's happened here expanding and developing and you get to you know the probably I think the last book that he well the last book to a church that he wrote he wrote one and two Timothy afterwards but you get to Colossians and you get this big idea in Colossians of Jesus is the image of the invisible God like everything is for him through him from him by him everything is held together in him he is the head of everything all atoms and all things and everything is held together in him it's created by him and it's in him and it's through him it's a big idea you can see Paul's theology kind of expanding as he goes through his letters. We see the Gospels being written, Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, and then the book of Acts being written, kind of around 50 through to about 60, um, 65 AD. And so we see the Gospels being written, and the other letters are being written around that point to around kind of early 70s. And then... John, around about 90, 95 AD. John's letters, the book of John, the book of Revelation come in. We think that actually the book of John, certainly for some scholars think it's the last thing that is written of our New Testament canon. And so it's written at the point that the early church has been working out what God is up to. The early church has been working out this gospel, has been working out the theology, has been working out the vastness of it, has been working out the, the whole story and what, how to make sense of it for 50, 60 years at this point. And that's what we see going on in the book of John. We see this big, expansive gospel. If we go to... The, just the first couple of verses of John. Yeah, I mean, the, this passage at the beginning of John is a very famous passage, but we could, we won't, but we could speak on this for a year. We won't, I promise, we won't. But we could speak on this. I mean, it is so full of so many threads. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I don't know what comes to mind when you hear that text, but it is big. Right? In the beginning was the word. And the Greek here for word is logos. And it's really significant. Just in that statement, John's inviting us to go to all sorts of different places. And you might go, well, in the beginning. Well, in the beginning, Genesis, right? That's the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning was God and God spoke words and light happened well that's all in this passage right he was the light and he was the word and so we're supposed to draw parallels with Genesis straight off so John's positioning Jesus not just as a guy who rocked up 2,000 years ago he's saying at the very beginning of all things Jesus was 
He was the words that God spoke. He was the word that brought light into being. And he wasn't just the word that brought light into being. He is the light. He wasn't just the word that brought life into being. He is the life. This is big cosmic stuff right in the beginning you've got God Jesus being positioned not just as a guy with some good ideas who did some amazing things but as the essence of all things we're supposed to take our mind to exodus maybe the decalogue the 10 words the law So this guy encapsulates the entirety of the law. But maybe we're supposed to take our minds to the prophets who spoke the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 1 verse 2, the word of the Lord came to me, spoke to me. 1 verse 4, the word of the Lord spoke to me. 1 verse 11, I mean Jeremiah uses the word of the Lord, I think some 85 times, the word of the Lord Isaiah uses it. The prophets talk about the word of the Lord coming to them, speaking to them. And John says, that word is this guy. That God is this guy. God with us. We might be thinking about the wisdom books because there was this idea that how can God be up there and distant and yet present. And we know that God is going to be present with us in the temple because that's what the prophets say. And so the, the wisdom books talk about wisdom as a person. And the Jewish theologians would talk about wisdom and the words somehow being the presence of God with. And right there in the first verse, John's going, yeah, that too. And we're supposed to not just draw our minds to the Old Testament, we're supposed to draw our minds to the New Testament because he's starting it very similarly to the way Mark starts his gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And John's going, in the beginning. We're supposed to be paralleling that. The good news uses the same root word of logos. So now, the good news, the gospel is encapsulated in Jesus. What the New Testament church has been working out to this point, it is all summed up in Jesus. Everything that has been, all the texts, all the scriptures, everything now is to be reread through the lens of Jesus. It's to be re-examined, it's to be revisited through who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And John's about to tell us the story of who Jesus is. You see, Jesus is the lens through which we read all scripture. Jesus is what God looks like. And John brings us into this at the beginning, but he doesn't just keep it to the Jewish mind to the Jewish faith he takes it beyond that as I've already said he starts drawing in parallels with different gods whether that be Bacchus or Dionysus or um, all sorts of different gods that he that he draws parallels with that he references because he transcends all gods and he talks to all these different faiths and these different cultures and said the things you worship the gods you worship are encapsulated in Jesus and Jesus transcends them. He is greater than. He speaks to all philosophy because Logos was this idea in Greek philosophy. If you want to go to Plato or Aristotle, they would talk about Logos being this underlying truth that was in everything. There's an underlying reality that we need to try and tap into and understand that holds all things together. That we're supposed to somehow connect with this and and it's what makes us human in that we have the ability to understand things that other parts of creation can't understand and make sense of things. We have the ability to know good and bad, to know right and wrong. And all of this they use the word logos for. And John says, in the beginning was the Logos. And this Logos, this thing you're looking for, isn't just an idea or a concept. It's a person. 
who went by the name of Jesus and is God. He's speaking to the Jewish faith. He's speaking to the Greek philosophers. He's speaking to the Roman gods and the Roman authorities. He's speaking to all humanity and saying, this is for all of us. This is for all of you. It's this vast, cosmic, huge sense of God. I'll quickly read this. Just first search. I went, okay, so Logos, Greek philosophy. First thing that came up was this. A principle originating in classical Greek thought which refers to a universal divine reason, imminent in nature, yet transcending all oppositions and imperfections in the cosmos and humanity. An eternal unchanging truth present from the time of creation available to every individual who seeks it and John took this idea and said and his name is Jesus this isn't just an idea this is a person God with us there's a film that came out this year some people's tip for the greatest film of the year. It's weird, but it's great. And it's called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And if I could think of a subtitle for John, that would be it. It's Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Because what he's trying to say is every thought, every life, every bit of truth, every time you encounter any of these things, every person, all people, all nations, all time, all things, all creation, all light, all truth, all life, all of it is held in Jesus. It's this vast idea. It's vast. It's transcendent. It's cosmic. It's eternal spanning the entirety of time it's a big idea and yet Jesus is intimate present relational love personified the vastness that is displayed through John goes hand in hand with the intimacy that is displayed in John John refers to himself, never by his name, always by the disciple that Jesus loved. Which might sound a bit arrogant, but one of the beautiful things I think it does is it invites us to see ourselves in that title. It invites us not just into the vastness of everything, which could really hurt our heads, but into the intimacy, into the love of God, into being the disciple that Jesus loves. This intimacy goes all the way through the book of John. Jesus talking about, I and the Father are one. I only do what I see the Father doing. This idea that Jesus talks to us about that he will leave his spirit with us to be with us, to be in us, to be through us so we can do the same things and greater things so we can carry this on, so we can participate in this kingdom which he has announced. We are invited to join in. We are invited into relationship. Hegel is a theologian of the 20th century and he said this. How simple and how extraordinary a symbol. Talking about the word. Yet how complex and inclusive. As a stimulus to the imagination, it was able to fuse together aspects of human experience that normally tend to fly apart. Hearing and doing, thinking and feeling, Remembering and hoping, the liturgical and the ethical, the doctrinal and the mystical, the inaudible and the audible, the eternal and the historical. 
this gospel of John is a wild ride of the vastness and the scale of God and the intimate, relational God who invites us. He invites us to know him and to be known by him. This invitation from God, the God of all cosmos, the God that holds all things together, nothing created, nothing that has been created is not created by him. Everything that has been created is from him. This God of everything, of all time, of all space, of all people, of all nations, of all creation, of all things, is a God who is with us, is a God who invites us into relationship. So we can all identify as a disciple that Jesus loves. Why don't we pray? Lord, we want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you for for Jesus, for being with us, for not just your teachings and your words and your acts and your salvation and your restoration and your healing, but that even though you are the God of all things, you're the God who loves me, who loves us, who invites us to know you and be known by you. You are eternal and vast and cosmic and you are personal and relational and loving and intimate. And Lord, as we embark on this journey of exploration of the book of John, may we be captivated by you. May we be transformed. May we move towards you, each of us, from wherever we are, from however far away we are. May each of us respond to that invitation to gravitate towards you, to move towards you, to say yes to you, to be transformed by you, to be renewed, to be healed, to be freed, to be saved, to be inspired. May each of us choose to participate in the kingdom you invite us into. And may we as a church come closer to you. May we as a community be transformed by you. And may we shine for our community, for our neighbours, for our nation, for the world. This is all yours, Lord. And we are yours. Amen.